Good evening and welcome to you uh, to this first and opening session uh, of Sunday at the Abbey. Father Bob Koopman really needs no introduction in this locale and probably in many others, Bob. Huh? He joined this monastery as a novice in, in uh, uh, September of 1970 uh, after doing an undergraduate degree in music here at St. John's and completing that BA in 68. And then he did a master's degree of of music at the uh, University of Wisconsin in Milwaukee. Uh, after making a uh, simple profession in, in the fall of September of 71, he began studying a theology towards ordination, but then interrupted that study and went to the University of Iowa to do his doctoral studies. And then after returning here uh, to, to do music, then ultimately went back and, and studied for the priesthood and was ordained in 1981. He also did uh, uh, a, a postdoc work with Arthur Mills at the Royal Academy of Music in New York, and also in 1985 with Martin Kanan at the Juilliard School of Music in New York. He's held a number of administrative posts here on the campus, including chair of the music department, dean of the fine arts uh, uh, area, and then president of the university from 2009 to 2012. Most importantly, I think, for tonight's presentation, Father Bob has been at the heart of our music program as a monastery for our Eucharistic and Liturgy of the Hours liturgies from the very beginning. And he has long had an interest in improvisation. He's created two CDs of Im improvised music. I will shamelessly say that they are on the back table. If you don't have them, you should have them. <laughs> They're wonderful. Um, the title of Father Bob's presentation tonight is The Art of Improvisation, Music and Spirituality. Please give a warm Collegeville welcome to Father Bob. Thank you, Abba John, for that uh, very kind introduction. Um, when I was a novice here, uh, my parents came to visit, and my mother wasn't very excited about me being a monk at that time. She later loved it. but uh, So I was uh, telling my folks about some trouble that I had gotten into with the socius or the work boss, and it was, he had scolded me very justifiably. And, uh, I, and my mother, I was complaining, and she said, well, this wasn't my idea. <laughs> so so this, this presentation tonight wasn't my idea either. <laughs> it was Abbot John's. I've done um, many, many presentations for musicians, and so piano teachers, organists on improvisation. But for a mixed crowd like this, I haven't before. So I'm... Um, I'm very pleased to do it and very excited, but uh, it's, it's quite different. So, um, uh, and I'm afraid that some of it is going to be all about Bob because uh, I have to explain to you how one learns to improvise. So I'm going to start, before I say much more, I'm going to start with a, um, a little bit of an improvisation on that hymn.
improvisation is as old as music itself, probably or for sure the earliest music that we know about was improvised, not written down. Uh, the classical musicians we know were good improvisers. Bach was said to be able to improvise a fugue on the spot. Mozart and Haydn uh, improvised their cadenzas in their piano concerti. Um, jazz mus musicians have certainly kept up the practice in our days, but much of the classical world has lost it. Um, some organists do it, um, but this is the only commonly done form of improvisation I know of in the classical uh, musical world. The, um, that uh, painting which I put up there for your uh, interest while you came in is called Improvisation and it's by Vasily Kandinsky uh, and he, very abstract, 1913. He did a, a number of these called Improvisation and I just thought it would be nice to post those because improvisation is not only in um, music but in a lot of other ways too. Barry Green in a book called The Inner Game of Music says that improvisation puts us in touch with music that comes from within us rather than from the composer. He also quotes William Blake and says that improvisation is a form of kissing the joy as it flies. So now I'm going to improvise on this next tune. Uh, the tune is called Love Unknown.
Now a bit about spirituality. Uh, music can and does bring us closer to God if we believe in the power of God to move us and change us. Because music is filled with a variety of feelings, co joyfulness, calmness, excitement, peace, sadness, pathos, longing, majesty, urgency, uh, and the list could go on and on. These feelings in the music take our own feelings, our own heartstrings, and cause them to vibrate in a different way. Because of this vibration of our heartstrings, we consequently experience our own worlds differently. If by listening to music we discover something about ourselves, some beauty or some good feeling or something sad or terrible, then music informs our hearts and souls and minds about creation, about our world, and about human beings. And then it also tells us about the God who is the creator of all of our universe, the God present everywhere we look, listen, and feel. Music does not, as far as I can tell, give us faith, does not make believers out of unbelievers, but music can lead us to discoveries of God's presence and awareness of God's action in places we never knew existed. What I'd like to do next, I'm going to take this hymn, and I'm going to ask you all, this looks like a very singing, uh, I could say congregation, um, and um, what I'd like to do, I'd like you all to sing the first two stanzas, um, and this, the reason I thought of this one, because La it was a last Sunday or the Sunday before we sang this, and the, the congregation raised the roof uh, with it because it's so familiar. So I'm going to ask you to, do, to sing verses, stanzas one and two, then I'm going to improvise, and then we'll sing stanzas three and four, and I suspect that you'll feel differently about three and four uh, after the improvisation because it opens up something new in the music. So you'll be able to tell when to come in with, uh, with stanza three, and also how to begin. It's just like in church. <laughs> so. <laughs>
nice singing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good choir. Yeah. Um, so I, I suspect that you heard that hymn a bit differently after the improvisation. And of course, I changed the key also. Um, I made it a little higher. Um, anyway, I, it's uh, just an example of uh, how one can improvise and bring things to life in a new way. Now I'm going to begin to tell you a little bit about how I improvise. Um, and I'm hoping that you'll be able to get something from this, whether you're a musician or not. And you can use it in uh, musical or non-musical settings. I, uh, let me tell you first about how I started improvising. Um, when I was uh, a small boy, my mother was a, a, a quite a competent amateur pianist. And she played popular music. This would have been in, oh, 1949, 50, 51 in there. And uh, she, never played, she never played anything the way it was written. So uh, I'll let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show, show you, uh, there, it's an old, old pop waltz and how it probably was written. I don't have any of the music, but I'll show you how it probably was written and then what she did with it. In words, uh, what, she, what she would do is she, she added octaves. So she was playing, uh, instead of the melody where it was really would be sung, she was, was adding an octave and then she would add other notes in between. And her bass notes would be an octave lower and it, it's what's called stride bass. You, um, you roll the, 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 the bass chords um, also, so yeah. But um, th this um, influenced me quite a bit. Um, as I, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> and, um, but I have to t uh, say that uh, she also made me learn how to read notes. And I, I started piano lessons when I was seven. And she practiced with me for the first couple of years. And she, she pounded in the, the note reading and all of that. And there were, she would sit at the top of the piano there, and there were broken hammers up there when she would, I didn't catch on fast enough, and she would say, get it, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So, uh, uh, and then when I was around 10, she said, uh, 
now you're on your own. You have to you have to do it from from now on. But she was. I, I appreciate that very much. That that uh, she got me started. So anyway, I had some background in improvisation, and then for some reason I started doing it on my own. I would uh, sometimes using hymns. Uh, sometimes uh, taking psalms and completely making up tunes um, to go with them, and then lots of popular music as well. So, so it came to me rather naturally, and um, yeah, I, it was just a, I just grew up with it, sort of. And there, that's part of it. So I was able to what we call play by ear. You know, so we would hear songs and uh, hear it on the radio, and I would be able to, I would pick it out and figure it out. So I came to the Abbey, and I was called on to play organ very soon, because there were few of us who could play. Father Gerard Farrell had gone off to teach at Westminster Choir College in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Father Cletus was playing, Father Cyprian was playing, um, Brother Vern Croning was playing, and I had minimal training in organ. I had had one semester of organ with Father Gerard during my first year, my freshman year, because uh, thanks to um, Willem Ebus, who's here, uh, I was, uh, um, I, I became so passionate about piano and piano repertoire that um, I said, I can't do two things at once. So um, I quit the organ, and uh, but um, I could improvise. So that saved me as I was called on. I think that I played for the Christmas Midnight Mass during my novitiate um, because it was only me and Vern. And Vern said, well, I'll kind of take care of the scola, and you play. So, uh, <laughs> so we, uh, it was very early that... Uh, and then I got, I got better and better because with improvisation, you have to do it. It's, it's the same thing. It's not, it, for example, I'm not a very good jazz player. Um, and the reason is because I don't do it. You have to do it. You have to um, develop a language. So uh, musicians use both the emotional and the intellectual parts of their brains for composing and performing. And in, in improvisation, we use both the emotional and intellectual parts of ourselves to improvise well. Barry Green, again, writes about working with spontaneity, creativity, intuition, and feeling, and balancing these functions with the analytical equivalents, discipline, logic, and so on. And so in improvisation, we need both. The emotional and the intellectual. And we don't just improvise in music, we improvise in many aspects of our lives. Um, for example, our personal prayer life might seem, at times, lifeless and boring and dry. Well, we should improvise with it. Change the time we pray. Start with someone else's prayer, printed prayers. Um, and if you continue your praying with Lexio Divina or sacred reading, Take some text you've never used before. Improvise with it. Um, seek God in new little corners and new places. Impro improvisation can be sinful as well. Gossip is improvising. So it's taking a few facts and then making up the most awful things <laughs> we can think of to surround those few facts. And that, that's very hurtful to people and certainly is sinful. So it's, improvising isn't always good. So I'm about to give you some steps that I go through in improvising, hoping that you will find it interesting. Actually, the, the little part about gossip, that was Father Cletus's idea. I told him I was going to give this. Uh, as some of you know Cletus, I said I'm going to give this. And he said, well, tell him that gossip is improvisation too. <laughs> and so, anyway. Uh, for musicians um, and our students, um, improvisation frees up one's relationship with the keyboard. One can become more relaxed at playing, more sure of oneself in performance situations, and put less distance between oneself and the keyboard. 
I've taught some of these methods at times, but don't include it as a regular part of every piano lesson. Rather, I use it to help those students who show an inclination for improvisation or whom I think will get a shot in the arm by doing this. Tonight, I limit my melodies to religious melodies, except for mother's tunes there. Um, but when I give workshops, I use all kinds of things, like my Bonnie lies over the ocean and old McDonald or, or anything. So um, I'm going to do this hymn. And I'm going to uh, take the first part of the melody, just the melody. Then I'm going, the second part, I'm going to add chords, whatever chords I come up with. And then I'm going to change the time signature. And this is what you do when you improvise. I'm going to change it from common time, or 4-4, four, four, to 3-4, or waltz time. We'll see what I come up with. So I think you could follow you could follow some of that, the, the, the melody alone, and then the chords, and then switching from uh, a four-four to a three-four. So improvisation is a whole different kind of music, and it in it uh, in certain uh, it engages our creativity in a different way. Um, there are practical reasons for us musicians to improvise in the liturgy, certainly. We can carry the spirit of the sung music into the next part of the worship or out the door. Um, um, and uh, musical uh, improvisation can also help our musical memory by getting us comfortable without notes in front of us. Clara Schumann, the very, very fine pianist, she was uh, the wife of the composer Robert Schumann. She was a composer in her own right, but she, her stature as a concert pianist was really on par with Franz Liszt, uh, but she didn't have all the showiness about herself. He was wearing his white gloves and um, throwing them out to the audience, and he was sort of a, a rock star. But uh, anyway, Clara was, was wonderful, and she said, pianists shouldn't play for memory after you're 50. She, she used the score. She said, we don't memorize uh, as well later. So. Don't even try. Now, I still play for memory at 67, and I think that my ability to improvise helps a lot. But now, this has to stay in this room. But, <laughs> but last, last Friday night, I played in pastiche, and I played three Rachmaninoff preludes. Well, I was a bit under the weather with uh, allergies and cold, and I had, and I had uh, uh, drugs in me and all kinds of stuff. So during the last Rachmaninoff, toward the end, I, I lost it. Um, so I made up a whole new ending. <laughs> 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 
So I hate that when that happens because I like to be true to the composer, but it really certainly helps a lot <laughs> to, to be able to do that. <laughs> one, of the, um, one of the necessities in musical improvisation to keep it from becoming musical gibberish and boring is you have to have a plan. And it, it might be a vague plan, but it has to be something. It can be as specific as taking a certain tune, a hymn tune, for example, or as vague as taking uh, th just three notes, saying, I'm going to see what I can do with that. Or to even have a, uh, oh, uh, you know, a non-musical concept like breezes, uh, or something like that, and, and see what, where that can take you. Or you can be as specific as theme and variations, or sonata allegro form, that, that's the, the form that the classical uh, composers uh, used very much. So when I teach uh, improvisation or give uh, these workshops, um, one of the things I say is you just have to do it. Just uh, spend time improvising. It might be a half hour a day, 15 minutes a day, five minutes a day, but just do it and then let go and try anything. Because as you're sitting there alone, you think, well, that's the stupidest thing ever. But you just do it anyway, because you start to uh, develop a vocabulary as you move along. Um, and uh, so you could do something as simple as taking a pentatonic scale. That's the black keys on the scale. And you could say, I'm going to do three bars of 3-4 and three bars of 4-4. Four, four. And then maybe put in some rests. Let me see if I can do that. The black keys. It's a little kind. Of, it's an assignment uh, that sometimes I I, I give. Um, you can also improvise above a bass line. Um, most of us know Pachelbel's Canon, and that's that's composed above a bass line. So I've uh, sometimes given that that bass line to a student. Um, or uh, you can take a, a form like Sonata Allegro, which is rather complicated. I had the very good fortune uh, and privilege to spend a semester learning more about improvisation from Dr. Arthur Wills of the Royal Academy in London. And he was the organist, this is way back in uh, 84, I think. He was the organist at Ely Cathedral in England, and every other week I would take the train up to Ely, and he would work with me after the cathedral doors were locked and the tourists gone and there was a large walker pipe organ and he would give me an assignment each time for example to improvise in theme and variations and he would tell me what he wanted uh, slow march or Siciliana that would be something in a 6-8 time uh, uh, and then I would go home and practice that in back in London um, or Sonata Allegro form, and then always I would use hymn tunes, and we use the old uh, Anglican hymnal, English hymnal. And uh, then I, when I would come back the next time, and he would say, oh, that's good, but your bass is not very interesting. Work on the bass next time. Or you could be more interesting in rhythms. And um, that's kind of how I got better um, at improvising, by having a goal like that, or a plan. And uh, so that's, that's just a little bit about the technical side of improvisation. Um, most of you who've heard me have certainly heard me play spirituals um, in, in church at mass and so on. And um, I'm, I'll, I'll do one in a moment. Um, uh, 
it's interesting that those go way back in my roots too, even though um, you know, I'm from a very white neighborhood in Waterloo, Iowa, but um, we would go to see my grandparents uh, in uh, near Dubuque um, a couple times a month, and then we'd get together with cousins or something, and, and we'd be driving back at night usually, and there was a radio program that my parents loved to listen to um, on KXEL radio, and it was a guy who played big band music, and that's what they were interested in. But he would throw in a little, and he would, happened to be an African-American guy, and he would throw in Mahalia Jackson, who was his, his hero. If some of you would know who she is. And uh, he always closed his program with her singing uh, the Lord's Prayer, the, the familiar one, Our Father, which art in heaven, but uh, there would be Precious Lord, and there would be a few other things every once in a while. And I would be just mesmerized, and I would remember those things. So uh, I uh, uh, learned that very early on and, and was very excited. I'm going to do uh, this one uh, briefly. By the way, this African-American spiritual has its roots in a much older West African tune, which they would sing when bringing a body by boat to a burial site. And then it got, became Christianized uh, in the United States. It's, it's an interesting uh, um, story about that. So here we are. I think I better wrap this up, actually. Um, this is supposed to be about 40 minutes long, and uh, I think we've used up about 40 minutes. So um, I hope you found this interesting. I've enjoyed uh, speaking with you and playing for you, um, and maybe you can uh, apply these principles to new ways in your lives. Now, if, we, if you have comments or questions, we do have a few minutes for that before we close it up. So thank you.
Mark. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if uh, <clears throat> your improvisation changes according to your audience, that you might think that they could understand tone clusters and, mm -hmm. and uh, really strange um, mm -hmm. uh, with chordal patterns and things like that more yes. than others. Yeah. It does. That's, that's, that's a good uh, uh, question because uh, I think if I'm playing for a group of musicians, I tend to be a little more uh, outside of traditional harmony. Um, I'll do it and then uh, sometimes people will come up and say, well, that sounded like Hindemith or you know, something like that. But yes, that's uh, what I do. It, it, the audience does, does influence quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Bob, do, you, do you ever find yourself, uh, you're improvising, and, and you, you, you take it turned down, and, and it's a dead end. <laughs> that is, it's all of a sudden, it's, like yeah. it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> well, I, I do, don't, it doesn't, just, no. Are there graceful ways to back out of that? Yeah, yeah. there are graceful ways. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, I think it was Brother John Hansen who pointed out one time, he said, you know, you make a mistake when you're playing, and then you just improvise on the mistake. And that's true. That's absolutely true. <laughs> Renee. I'd like to ask two questions. They're asking you to tell a story. You sort of fits in this. When you were playing as a young artist at Carnegie Hall, in that competition. Oh. Thank you. That's, those are good, uh, good questions. The first one is funny. I was playing in the finals of the, I think it was the Naumburg competition at, in Carnegie Hall, in fact. And uh, this is a long time ago. And I was playing two pieces by WC. One was called um, What the West Wind Has Seen, and the other one was called Undine. They were two preludes. And somehow, I, w I started Undine, and I ended up in What the West so, <laughs> so I, I, I said to people who were listening, I said, I just played what Undine saw. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I didn't win that competition. <laughs> and um, uh, it did, uh, my, my time in Africa certainly did influence my, uh, my uh, improvisational style. Um, uh, I, I, not only what they did in churches, but and that was exciting. I tried to go to his, uh, to some of the um, more evangelical type of uh, in South Africa, the um, African American no, the black churches, um, the Zionist churches, where you would you would actually see the building shaking uh, outside because they were <laughs> there was so much drumming and all kinds of stuff going on. And uh, that did influence me quite a bit. Uh, I couldn't tell you exactly how. Um, I think I got away a little bit from this, what Mark was talking about. I think I used to be more um, thinking about, you know, what would Hindemith do or what would uh, somebody else do. And um, the, uh, also the East African, it's so repetitive. It's so repetitive. Um, and I, I got, I listened to township jazz. That was in Port Elizabeth, uh, South Africa. I was directing South Africa program. And uh, it was, I just thought it was wonderful. It was, it was, it was n not as um, refined as American jazz at all, but it, w and it was rough, sort of. But, um, and, and they had terrible instruments because this was 2000. That wasn't so long after um, Mandela finally got out of jail, you know, that was in the late 90s, or mid-90s, and they had terrible instruments, uh, saxophones that were just, you know, they looked awful, and pianos that were way out of tune, and they were doing the best that they could, and they made wonderful music, wonderful, really vibrant and alive music. Um, 
but that was township jazz. So yes, I was definitely influenced by that. And some of the tunes I, I still use uh, once in a while, like as a as as a um, um, an encore in a in a classical recital. Uh, yes. Huh? No. Oh, no. <laughs> Please. Okay. Uh, with one rib. Let's see what you do with it. Uh, deep in the Benedictine tradition, uh, as you know, is the story of uh, Benedict and Scholastica and their last meeting. Yes. Right. And, um, she pleads with him not to, you know, this is their chance, yearly chance to talk. Right. And, uh, but then prays, when he insists on going, she prays, thunderstorm, he has to stay. Uh huh. So you want me to improvise on that? <laughs> uh, well, you've got, but you've talked about the structure, but then you run and you rip on it. You, you so certainly could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, uh, yeah. There, there is always that balance um, um, in all, in 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 our lives, and it's it's uh, we balance it all the time. Those of us in the monastery, well, anybody who's following or uh, interested in the rule, we're always pulled between the rules and what what uh, maybe could be done for our students or our audience or whatever and then I mean I've, I've struggled with that my whole life um, you know I haven't been to prayer for a while I gotta get there you know and then what about my students and it's just a it's a balance that we we, we, we continue continually struggle with and it's a healthy one actually if if we're thinking of that and don't just give up you know especially on the monastic side um, uh, yeah, yeah that, and that's a danger. You know, you get so involved. You're president of the university, and you're, um, you know, you, you have so many things to think about. Um, so, yeah, that's true. Now, the the sisters at the St. Benedict's Monastery. One time, we did a skit on uh, with some of us and some of them, and uh, the song that we used was "Raindrops Keep Falling on My Head." <laughs> JP had a Oh yeah. That's right. That was that's right. <laughs> that's right. That's way back, yeah. Yeah. Right. This was Sister Thea Theo Bauman. Bowman. She's 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 of happy memory. She's she's died now, um, but she was coming up and she was giving a presentation on ministry to blacks, and she called that morning to some of the guys that were sponsoring this, and she said, "My pianist is sick. I better not come." And they said, "No, we got somebody for you." <laughs> and so, so. Uh, she came and she was, she actually belongs to the same community that my aunt, uh, although she lived in Mississippi, my aunt's sister Helen in La Crosse. And uh, she was very nervous and she said, well, let's go to the piano. And she said, here's my list of all the songs. What she would do was she would sing and, were you there, John? Yes, I was in America. Oh, okay. And uh, she, uh, so we, we, I think we started with Precious Lord, and and uh, it was wonderful. You know, we just we uh, she told me I, I saw what key she needed, and we did it. And and she said, uh, I was shaking in my boots all the way up here. I thought I'm going to have to sing with his honky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Rivers was here at the same time. 
Okay. And Don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Bob, thank you. Thank you. My pleasure.